So, Danny, we talked a lot about high risk subgroups, CNS metastases. That's a population that I worry about a lot. And I'm, you know, thinking about escalation in those patients. But what about patients with liver metastases or, you know, co mutations in P53, a tumor suppressor gene, or other high risk features that you could think about in your clinical practice? How do you utilize that information? Do you discuss that with the patient in your practice? Well, I try to discuss with the, uh, those points with my patient as much as I feel like they can potentially wrap it. Um, the nice thing is that um, we do actually have that data. Um, it seems like combination therapy in general it is superior to lisimer demonic therapy in these high-risk uh, subgroups, uh, including liver metastases, uh, TP to TP uh, commutation, as well as uh, patients who have a positive CT DNA after starting their treatment. Um, so yeah, in those in those particular cases, combination therapy does seem to be superior. Um, so, uh, but then also I think that that's something that will be presented uh, today at NACLC um, is that uh, at least in AMU events, not plus or hip, um, uh, for patients who had been able to make it to uh, 36 months of treatment, um, there doesn't seem to be any particular subgroup that benefited more. Um, um, on M of Infinite Pluses or M. So it's also also good to say, like, um, even in uh, normal risk or low risk um, subgroups, um, some patients, those patients may still benefit from M of Infinite Pluses or it. It's just that high risk may benefit even more so. I agree. I think combination therapy benefits all patients. I think we have to weigh the risks and the benefits with patients in the office. And, you know, like you said, Alex, you have a discussion with a patient, shared decision making. They usually say, well, what would you do with your mother? And, and I always joke, is it my mother or my mother-in-law, right? You know, you have to have that discussion. How you like that, John? No, I have that discussion with patients. So let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about adverse events with the combination strategies. Andy, I, I want to go to you here. What are some of the adverse events that you think about and talk to your patients about with amibanthamab and lizertinib? And, you know, tell me about some of the strategies and some of the data around how to mitigate those, how to improve patients' quality of life while getting these therapies that are improving their survival. That is one of my favorite topics, Joshua, because uh, when we have a so active drug uh, like AMI last together, already improved PFS and overall survival, and again, we don't know the median overall survival yet, then the issue here is adverse event, okay? And just to remind, when we uh, did a mariposa and all my colleagues, you know, around the, the globe did a mariposa trial, and we were sitting down, listening to the first presentation, we were a little bit uh, concerned about the toxicity from the mariposa, how the mariposa was developed. But a lot of things happened since 2023 when it was presented at ESMO Congress in Europe until today. So I need to applaud the sponsor of the mariposa that they went back with the investigator and start to analyze key issues that happen with mariposa. We know with the amibantamab, one of the things that we have is the infusion related reaction that was added recently in a study called Skip IRR. Uh, easy, believe it or not, a very a good story developed by the sponsor, uh, different arms, and at the end of the day, the winner was dexamethasone. Okay, so um, that has been taken care of, reducing the efficient related reaction from 66% to 22%. Okay, and that is giving on the week one, when we divide Amivantama in two days, because the efficient related reaction we procured at that moment. Then we also saw a VTE, venous thromboembolic events like 11% in grade 3 and above. Why is that? We don't use prophylactic or any anticoagulation where we use AMI plus chemo. But for some reason, when we combine AMI plus the certainty, that rate goes up. So the study was amended, and immediately we start to shut down that VTE incidence by using prophylactic um, uh, anticoagulation uh, with these uh, DOATs, uh, either um, a, a Pixaban or... Uh, Sarelto or Pradaxa or any of those, including also low molecular weight heparin. And then the other thing is the rash. Okay, this is a concern because we are targeting EFR dual inhibition from the extracellular domain by AMI plus the lacertri in the intracellular domain of the EFR uh, uh, receptor. So we expect more rash. On the initial uh, presentation, when I saw these 26% grade 3 adverse events in rash, everyone was concerned. But things also started to improve. And one of them was like we are moving from being reactive to the management of rash to being proactive. 
So another story that shows up is Cocoon. Okay, so think about that movie in the 1970s when Michael Foles was a teenager. So Cocoon. So what is that? Well, basically, we are going to be, instead of being reacting away for the people to get a rush in the skin like this, and then forget it, we are going to be proactive. And that proactive means we are going to start to use antibiotics from the beginning. The same thing that we have done. We stay again, be reactive, proactive. So before the patient starts the therapy on a way that he goes to receive AMI to the chemo unit plus lacertinib, give the patient a prescription for either minocycline or docicycline. Beside that is also the use of chlorhexidine to reduce the incidence of paronychia, the use of ceramide or any kind of moist to keep the, the, the skin moist and use the you slim, uh, long sleeve, protect you yourself from the sun exposure, use your Mexican hat, okay? So it's true. And that's the same way I told my patients. And we'll talk about later, you know, about, about Copernicus, how those patients are doing. So we already target that rash. And in Cocoon, on the initial report, on grade two and above, guess how much is the adverse event? 4.3%. Is it very much more? So, and also I want to mention that the sponsor of this mariposa continue tracking down the patient because remember, we haven't found a median overall survivor. So all those patients are being washing uh, out. So how much is the grade three now on the rash? It's 17%. Why? Because on the mariposa, we already understood that the most critical period in the first four months. After that, every single toxicity, rash, paronychia, stomatitis, diarrhea, start to subside significantly down. So uh, those are the things that we have done since the mariposa. So again, the skip IRR for the infusion re reaction, the BT prophylaxis, and the management of dermatologic toxicity based on cocoon trial. Eddie, phenomenal overview. And I think it's interesting to think about you know, where we were when we started developing amibatinib back in 2019 to where we are now, you understand a lot more about the therapy. And I think we can think about that with any therapy we use in our clinical practice. You know, it's our job as oncologists uh, to learn how to better utilize these treatments for our patients, especially if they're driving overall survivors. So I want to actually go into each one of these adverse events because I think it's important for the oncologist listening. So Eric, for an IRR, an infusion-related reaction, this to me was one of the most concerning things early on, and I don't think about it anymore because I have a process, a plan set up, I educate patients. So what does an IRR look like in your clinic nowadays? What are you doing to prevent or mitigate the infusion-related reaction? Yeah, so these are great questions. So first of all, I really great summary out of you. Everything that we're doing in these proactive strategies. So there's Marposa 2 and then there's Marposa 2.0, right? Where we have all of these new proactive strategies. We're really trying to help patients get through this journey. And like you said very nicely, it's that key four months, right? Where we get to the four months and things get better. So what I'm doing in my plenty, first, I'm not seeing as much fusion weighted reactions for two reasons. One, I had integrated the, the skipper regimen. So dexamethasone is absolutely happening before patients start amivantamab. We're supporting them on the day of receiving amivantamab. And also the severity, right? If it does happen, it's much less severe, which is really important to be, right? So eight milligrams, two days before, a day before, the day of therapy, dramatically you message and reduces the risk. What else? We're also going to talk a little bit about the Copernicus, like the hinting about the subcutaneous amivantanet. You do not have the infusion related reaction with that. And so I think that's really meaningful and important. I have several patients on the Copernicus study and they seem to be doing very well. And we've really removed that concern. So I think time toxicity, that impact on infusion related reaction, those are very meaningful sort of endpoints as well. All right, so Copernicus is a frontline study using subcutaneous amivantamab and lazertinib, and we're actually taking in all of these strategies that you mentioned, Eddie, to try to reduce and mitigate some of these adverse events. So the IRR was splitting the dose right now for IV into day one and day two. We're prophylaxing patients with therapy, and I agree with you. I think by using, you know, dexamethasone pre-treatment, we're dramatically seeing a reduction. But again, I just educate patients to tell them this is what we expect to see Cycle one, day two, the rate of the infusion reaction is near zero. What, what I'll also say too, Josh, just real quickly is this isn't a new concept of giving proactive medication for it. We do this for some therapy, right? So we try to prevent, um, you know, counts from getting low and we do the lift growth factor. We also give them steroids for nausea. So yes, it sounds like a lot, but it's not something new as medical oncologists, right? It's our job to really help support patients. So we need to stay educated and we need to be educating our patients. Sure. Agreed.